Good morning once again, 10.30, we're starting here. My name is Timothy Schmeling. I am a professor of theology and history here at Bethany Lutheran College, and I have the esteemed privilege to introduce to you our third speaker here today, Reverend Dr. David A. Lump. Uh, David A. Lump is a professor of theology at Concordia University, St. Paul, Minnesota, where he has taught since 1990. Educated at Concordia Senior College, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where he received his Bachelor of Arts degree, and Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, Missouri, where he received his MDiv, his STM, and his THD in a concentration in systematic theology. He began his teaching ministry in 1984 at Concordia College, Ann Arbor, Michigan. From 2008 through 2011, he was Dean of the College of Vocation and Ministry at Concordia, St. Paul. And from 2012 through June of 2016, he was Dean of Concordia's College of Arts and Letters. He has been a frequent presenter at academic conferences and seminars, and he has published in theological journals in the United States, Germany, and Australia. He is the author of First Things First, a primer in Lutheran theological prolegomena and he is a collaborating editor of Confessing the Gospel, a Lutheran approach to systematic theology, a two-volume dogmatics that'll be published by Concordia Publishing House, hopefully in the end of 2017 or the beginning of 2018, a much anticipated uh, dogmatics. I know I've been looking forward to seeing this uh, produced. In this dogmatics, under the general editorship of Samuel Navsker, uh, Dr. Lump is the drafter of the Locus on Prolegomena. Dr. Lump's denominational service includes three years on the LCMS Commission on Worship and nine years on its Commission on Theology and Church Relations. He and his wife, Shirley, and she's here with us, I think, this morning, and she's been here. Very happy to have you here with us. Lives in Roseville, Minnesota. And can I have you join me in welcoming Dr. Lump? Thank you. I will say, I will save my extended expressions of gratitude to our hosts until this afternoon and move directly into the paper itself. You have an earlier version of the paper in front of you. The outline is the same and its substance is largely the same. I have shortened it a bit for this presentation. Hopefully I've shortened it enough and I have made a few changes along the way. First, setting the theological political stage. To His Serene Highness Prince John Frederick, Duke of Saxony, Landgrave of Thuringia, Margrave of Meissen, my gracious Lord and patron, serene and high-born Prince, gracious Lord, may your grace accept my humble prayer and service. This is the beginning of Martin Luther's dedication to his exposition of Mary's Magnificat, dated March 10, 1521, which he wrote to John Frederick when he was about to turn 18 years old. Luther did not actually finish the commentary on the Magnificat until June 10th. About three weeks after Luther wrote this dedication, he left for the Diet of Worms, where he was officially condemned by Emperor Charles V on May 26. In April, Luther was spirited off to the Wartburg Castle in Eisenach by agents of John Frederick's uncle, Frederick the Wise. There, Luther remained until March of 1522, praying, translating the New Testament, preparing various other writings, and especially being anxious for the fate of the Reformation in Wittenberg. John Frederick and his father, John the Constant, were early visitors to Wittenberg to hear Luther preach. While Frederick the Wise had maintained neutrality and distance with respect to Luther, the loyalties of John the Constant and John Frederick were never in question. 
Eleven years after Worms and the exile at the Wartburg, John Frederick succeeded his father and thus became the Elector of Saxony in 1532. In his new role, John Frederick assumed not only the traditional, more political responsibilities of the office. In a series of treatises going back to 1520, Luther had laid the foundations for a particular understanding of the complex interworkings of the church and the secular order. In Luther's unfolding of his own set of themes and guiding principles, godly princes would assume the role of emergency bishops. They did so not by virtue of their posi positions as secular sovereigns of a given territory, nor in confusion of Luther's two kingdoms, but rather as members of the priesthood of all the baptized. They were Christians first, and they had been entrusted with the additional vocation of ruler of a particular territory. So in one important sense, the Saxon electors played as significant a role in the leadership of the Wittenberg Reformation as did the theological faculty of the university. We turn to Luther's activities from 1532 to 1546. The outlines of Martin Luther's biography, even for these later years under John Frederick as his prince, are relatively familiar. Yet an identification of the highlights of the, these years does provide a sense of how the work Luther did with John Frederick as his territorial ruler helped expand and solidify his own theological legacy and enhanced the foundation of the theological movement he had initiated in 1517. Shortly, I will focus quite intentionally on the theology reflected in several key materials that Luther produced during these years. This focus underscores a central thesis of this study, namely that the evangelical theology confessed at Augsburg in 1530 both informed and drove the partnership between Luther and John Frederick. This thesis also counters the older claim that in light of the support Luther enjoyed from three successive friendly electors, his movement should be characterized as a prince's reformation. Frederick the Wise, John the Constant, and John Frederick certainly protected Luther and their university. And at least in the early days, Luther owed them his life. Still, this was not a prince's reformation. The primary sources, especially perhaps the correspondence, have led contemporary historians to revise, and in Luther's case, even reverse this judgment. Luther's stature, his theological stature by 1532 was secure, but his life under John Frederick was still eventful. In 1534, Luther published his completed German Bible. In 1535, he published the Lectures on Galatians, which he had delivered in 1531. In 1536, he agreed to the Wittenberg Concord in an attempt to resolve disputes over the Lord's Supper. In December of 1536, a grievously ill Luther both wrote and dictated the small called articles, which he identified as his last theological will and testament. In 1539, Luther prepared one of his classic works on the councils and the church. In 1541, he participated from a distance in the debates over justification at the Regensburg Colloquy. All the while, from 1535 on, Luther was lecturing on the book of Genesis, a project he did not complete until shortly before his death. We turn now to John Frederick of Saxony and a few brief biographical highlights. <clears throat> 
The three electors of Saxony under whom Luther served were part of the indispensable supporting cast of the Lutheran Reformation. But John Frederick does not appear in the Luther movies the way his more celebrated uncle does. Students of the Reformation usually have only an incidental awareness of the role of John Frederick, an event here or there. Therefore, I will try to set those public moments into a wider biographical context. John Frederick was 20 years younger than Luther, born in 1503 in Torgau. He was educated especially by George Spalatin, Luther's friend and ally and one of the most important figures in the electoral court. As noted yesterday, Spalatin was the personal contact between the faculty of the university and the three successive electors. And in that role, he conveniently introduces the second thesis of this presentation, theology and not princes or politics drove the Reformation movement. That was the first thesis. But second, this was a theology cultivated and propelled by a particular kind of university education, one informed by the central disciplines of Renaissance humanism. Spalatin was a humanist. When the electors wanted academic advice, they asked Spalatin. Spalatin had been taught by Wittenberg humanists, and when the electors asked him for advice, he gave them essentially humanist answers. As we noted a moment ago, John Frederick had supported Luther and the Reformation even during his adolescence. In 1520, Luther thanked John Frederick for his expression of support following the papal bull, Exerge Domine, which had condemned 41 of Luther's teachings and had given him 60 days to recant. Along with his father, John Frederick vigorously supported the visitations of congregations in Saxony and Thuringia. While John the Constant rightfully was front and center politically at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530, his son was there too. And his is the fifth name on the list of the Confessions signers. Also, John Frederick was among those who corresponded with Luther and even visited him at Coburg, where Luther stayed during the events at Augsburg. In 1532, John Frederick succeeded his father as elector. From this position, his support of Luther and the university never wavered. What he lacked in political and diplomatic dexterity, he made up for in theological determination. In 1535, his commitment to a well-educated clergy led John Frederick to order the examination, calling, and ordination of pastoral candidates, implicitly again fulfilling his role as emergency bishop. This order was soon accepted in Lutheran churches everywhere. John Frederick's theological resolve was tied directly to his commitment to the university his uncle Frederick had founded. In 1535 and 1536, he participated in the reorganization of the university with a budget and significant financial support. In general, John Frederick did everything he could to make the last 15 years of Luther's life as materially comfortable as possible. Also, John Frederick promoted efforts to publish an authoritative collection of Luther's Latin works, and significantly, John Frederick confirmed and validated Luther's will in 1546, in which Luther countered prevailing custom and left his estate to his wife, Katie. In the early and mid-1540s, Luther was drawn into a complicated web of territory uh, territorial, political, and religious intrigue in which John Frederick had helped expel Henry the Younger from his position as Duke of Braunschweig-Wolfenbüttel. In 
when Henry had explicitly likened John Frederick to a popular German comedy character, Luther responded with, against Hans Furst, turning the tables and applying this figure from German satire to Duke Henry himself. In the process, he offered an important elaboration of key elements of Lutheran's ecclesiology. In this same general time frame, Luther wrote to the Saxon princes, urging John Frederick and Philip of Hesse not to release Henry from his incarceration. Here, Luther defined, excuse me, here Luther identified doctrine with the core of his teaching, and he reemphasized the well-established distinction between doctrine and life. Those who do have an episodic familiarity with John Frederick's life and career usually have in mind his role both in the events surrounding the preparation of the small called articles in late 1536 and in the events almost immediately following Luther's death in 1546. With respect to the small called articles, John Frederick consistently wanted nothing to do with a council called for by Pope Paul III. He was suspicious of colloquies and councils in general, and this was a no-win situation. While Luther also had no illusions about such a council, he had been calling one for nearly 20 years. If conducted under the appropriate circumstances and ground rules, the proposed council would be another opportunity for confession of the faith. And for the reformers, confession of the faith was a witness to the faith. But careful preparation was necessary before Lutherans would consider attending any council that Rome might call and to this end, John Frederick directed Luther to prepare what came to be called the Small Called Articles in late 1536. Finally, John Frederick is probably best known for his role after Luther died in 1546 in February. These events brought together John Frederick's greatest weaknesses and his greatest strengths. Tactically and politically, as leader of the Small Caldic League, he was not up to the machinations of Emperor Charles V or Saxon Duke Moritz. His own armies were routed at the Battle of Muehlberg on April 24, 1547. By resigning his electorship, he was spared a death sentence in exchange for life in prison. When imperial and German circumstances changed yet again, he was released from prison in 1552. John Frederick never wavered in his theological confession, when doing so would have secured his release from captivity. This kind of courage earned him the appellation John Frederick the Magnanimous, and he has been listed on some of the lists, some but not all, of the lists of Protestant martyrs. We turn to Luther and his elector's theological priorities. Professor Luther worked under and with Elector John Frederick for 14 years. These 14 years were both eventful and central to Luther's overall theological project. I offer four, four recurrent themes from the most important writings of this period. First, Luther's understanding of the gospel is absolutely clear, and its place or position and function in his work becomes as vital as the definition itself. Second, this understanding of gospel arises out of the clear writings of the Old and New Testaments, both of which he read in thoroughly Christocentric terms. Third, this gospel plays a central role not only in Luther's theologically constructive work, but also in his polemics. Fourth, 
This gospel elicits a theology of vocation that is central to Luther's understanding of sanctification and is conducive to a real-world piety sensitive to the circumstances of 16th century German life. As noted earlier, Luther published his lectures on Galatians in 1535, which he had delivered to university students shortly before the ascendancy of John Frederick. They are perhaps the clearest and most penetrating presentation of his theology, as well as that of his Wittenberg colleagues. In the argument to the letter of the, Gal to the Galatians, he identifies as our theology the distinction between the passive righteousness of God's forgiveness bestowed upon sinners in Jesus Christ and the active righteousness of human performance. This distinction has its complement in the more pervasive and prominent distinction between law and gospel. Together, these two interdependent distinctions replace all medieval, late medieval merit schemes they keep the gospel promise unconditional, and they provide the conceptual support for the mature Lutheran doctrine of justification. One important essay that is not usually anthologized is Luther's commentary on Psalm 101, which he wrote in 1533 or 1534, shortly after the ascendancy of John Frederick. This commentary followed the commentary on Psalm 82, which he had probably written in early 1530. Both commentaries discuss the duties of a Christian prince, the first likely in connection with the Saxon visitations, and the second, in effect, to speak the truth candidly to one newly in power. Both the spiritual and the temporal estates are ordinance, ordinances of God which call for obedience and honor from all. The role of princes is to promulgate just laws and thereby to preserve the rights especially of the poor, orphans, and widows, and to protect the community against harm, force, and violence by means of the sword if necessary. These two, in Luther's thinking, follow the first virtue, profit, fruit, and good work that God has appointed for the prince, which is to support and protect godly pastors in their ministry of proclaiming and teaching the word of God. In the interest of time, I will skip the block quote on your pages 7 and 8, I believe, only become, because it comes from the commentary Luther wrote before John Frederick was his elector. Later in the commentary on Psalm 82, Luther made this categorical statement. Therefore, as there is no greater jewel in the world than a God-fearing Lord, so there is no more hurtful plague in the world than a godless Lord. In the commentary on Psalm 101, Luther wrote in part to ensure that the new elector, John Frederick, would be the former and not the latter. Even though he never actually mentions him by name, he does mention the others, because humanly speaking, the already high stakes would only get higher. Luther assumes the foundation laid in the commentary on Psalm 82. And now he underscores not only the priority of the spiritual to the secular realm and their connections under the authority of the one word and will of God, but also their distinctions. The spiritual government or authority should direct the people vertically toward God that they may do right and be saved. Just so the secular government should direct the people horizontally toward one another, seeing to it that body, property, honor, wife, child, house, home, and all manner of goods remain in peace and security and are blessed on earth. 
God wants the government of the world to be a symbol of true salvation and of his kingdom of heaven, like a pantomime or a mask. He lets the great saints run their course in it too, some better than others, but David the best of all. To be sure, God made the secular government subordinate and subject to reason, because it is to have no jurisdiction over the welfare of souls or things of eternal value, but only over physical and temporal goods, which God places under man's dominion. For this reason, nothing is taught in the gospel about it, that is, about the secular government. Nothing is taught in the gospel about how it is to be maintained and regulated, except that the gospel bids people honor it and not oppose it. In the process of unfolding these distinctions and relationships, Luther introduces a cluster of themes that are relevant not only to John Frederick, but also to two governments considerations in any era, including the 21st century. While these texts provide no definitive answer to a 21st century query asking what Luther would do if he were here in our present context, he does offer some abiding counsel and cautions. First, Princes and clergy must both remember their respective and coextensive roles. Second, reason and natural law are to be praised and cultivated. But neither one is universally pursued, much less are they self-evident. In fact, the opposite is the case. Third, the success of princes and kings depends absolutely on the intercession of God's little remnant, the church. Fourth, because moderation is in such short supply, the best course of action is to give priority to mercy over justice. Finally, extraordinary leaders are great gifts, rare figures through whom God himself rules. Indeed, stability and success are blessings from God and not personal achievements. Commenting on Psalm 101, verse 1, princes should learn to trust in God and call upon him, that he may guide and direct their hearts toward a successful administration. Especially, they should ask God not to withdraw his hand or to let them carry on by themselves through their own shrewdness and clever schemes, or to venture boldly into something that is too high for them. For that does not make for stability, and the end thereof will be foul and unsavory. While John Frederick was not without his personal and political shortcomings, of which Luther was acutely aware, John Frederick's drinking issues being the most notorious of the lot, he never, John Frederick, never lost sight of this truth, or stated in more theocentric terms, he never lost sight of the priority of the first commandment before and over everything else. None of this theological expression occurred in an educational vacuum. All of the early confessional writings were prepared by the two most celebrated professors of the University of Wittenberg. Certainly, Luther and Melanchthon were persons of theological and academic genius. But they were also men of indefatigable industry who seized and cultivated the tools of the ancient languages, rhetoric, and history. And they brought them all into the service of theological expression. Fortunately, their electors were also champions of the reformers' theological and educational causes. And none of their political lords was more important to these interconnected endeavors than John Frederick. Shortly before John the Constant died in 1532, he implored his son to support the University of Wittenberg at all costs, because under the leadership of Luther and Melanchthon, the gospel was now being taught in electoral Saxon schools. The university, as we heard yesterday, had been founded by Frederick the Wise in 1502. 
on the academic model of the more celebrated institutions like Paris and Bologna. While Luther had presented his fresh and Christocentric reading of the scriptures in its lecture halls, the university had also come to experience its share of challenges. The imperial condemnation of Luther at Worms and the attendant pressure from both Rome and the emperor, the reckless reforms of Karlstadt, and the enthusiasm of the Zwickau prophets all took their toll on the university, not least of all in its enrollment. John Frederick made the enhancement of the university one of his most important projects. Early on, he met with Luther himself, and then with a theology faculty. Soon, he set about reorganizing the School of Theology as well as the entire university in order to inculcate better the new theology of Wittenberg. The reorganization was comprehensive. John Frederick or his immediate emissaries devoted their attention to finances, including endowments and scholarships, enrollment, salaries, the structure of degree programs, including the restoration of the theological doctorate and disputations to that end in 1533, better living quarters for star faculty like Luther and Melanchthon, and major improvements to the library and its holdings. Bolstering the library is the transition to the most important and lasting dimension of John Frederick's university project. Simply stated, library holdings serve curriculum. And this is where John Frederick effected what amounted to a new university. The Wittenberg theology was based not on the sentences of Peter Lombard or the metaphysics of Aristotle, but on Luther's exegesis of the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament. This called for a different curriculum and different research tools for the library, namely course offerings and resources that reflect and support a Renaissance humanism grounded above all in philology and classical rhetoric. With the indispensable help of such linguistic aids, Luther, Melanchthon, and their colleagues had unlocked the treasures of the prophetic and apostolic scriptures, and they had confessed them before the world at Augsburg. For John Frederick, not only did theology and education go together, Indeed, theology and education served mission. And for the gospel mission to go forward across Europe and beyond, the curriculum of his university had to support it for the next generation. To summarize very briefly, a new set of statutes for the School of Theology crafted by Melanchthon in 1533 and reflecting these curricular reforms became part of a second founding of the university. And the contents of these statutes were incorporated into John Frederick's foundation document of 1536 for the entire university. This work is considered so important that John Frederick is regarded as the second founder of the University of Wittenberg. In reconstituting the university, John Frederick made certain that the specific duties of both Luther and Melanchthon were the least specified and the least prescribed of the faculty, simply because so many other tasks demanded their attention and their unique gifts. And never was this on greater display than in 1536, when John Frederick directed Luther to prepare what would become these small called articles, to which I referred earlier. These articles are important for what they tell us about the central tenets of Luther's theology, his hermeneutics, his gospel-centered ecumenism, 
and his determination to expound the articles of faith in a way that expresses their intrinsic connection to the gospel. Anchored in the classical Trinitarian and Christological faith of the ancient creeds, Luther begins part two with a summary of his Haupt article, Christ and Faith, and note how he proceeds. There is virtually no exposition. Instead, in five short paragraphs, Luther fuses seven absolutely central biblical passages, including two from Isaiah, one from the Gospel according to John, one from Acts, and three from Romans, the meanings of which he regarded as self-evident. Together, they express the core of Luther's and John Frederick's Gospel. Nothing in this article can be conceded or given up, even if heaven and earth or whatever is transitory passed away. On this article stands all that we teach and practice against the Pope, the devil, and the world. Therefore, we must be quite certain and have no doubt about it. Otherwise, everything is lost, and the Pope and the devil and whatever opposes us will gain victory and be proved right. The rest of the small called articles demonstrate Luther's fidelity to the biblical gospel and his adherence to this principle. The remainder of part two is a tightly argued polemic against the Roman mass, the invocation of the saints, foundations and monasteries, and the papacy itself. Luther declares that these lack any foundation in the word of God, they burden consciences, and thus they are injurious to souls. But his, <clears throat> but his overriding argument is a gospel one. That is, each of these Roman institutions is contrary to the gospel itself. Luther picks up the language of part one, article one, namely that of Christ and faith, as the first and chief article. The mass directly and violently opposes this chief article. The invocation of saints is also one of the abuses of the Antichrist that is in conflict with the first chief article and that destroys the knowledge of Christ. Fraternities and monasteries are likewise contrary to the first and chief article concerning redemption in Jesus Christ. Finally, the Roman papacy, which draws Luther's famous identification as Antichrist invites this indictment because it negates the first chief article on redemption by Jesus Christ. Luther had been directed by the elector not only to state the central doctrinal elements on which no compromise was possible, but also to identify those articles on which some concession could conceivably be made he did not fulfill this element of John Frederick's instructions, at least not literally. And this omission was not a matter of personal stubbornness. Rather, his decision to proceed as he did in part three of the small called articles was theologically driven. The topics he took up in part three, when developed theologically, were all dimensions of the biblical witness organically related to the gospel, that is, to Christ and faith, and to the creedal unfolding of the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity and the person and work of Jesus. Therefore, at the end of the articles, Luther concludes, these are the articles on which I must stand and on which I intend to stand, God willing, until my death. I can neither change nor concede anything in them. If anyone desires to do so, it is on that person's conscience. The fact that Luther had every reason to believe that his death was imminent in December of 1536 only heightens the eschatological dimension of this statement and of the articles to which it refers. The projected council for which the small called articles were an indirect part of Lutheran preparation did not take place, unless you want to count the Council of Trent. Uh, 
But Luther's concern for the constellation of issues that came to expression in these articles persisted. Small called articles were published in 1538, and Luther began preparing on the councils and the church at the same time, finishing it in 1539. Luther's essay is known for its treatment of the appropriate role of church councils and the theologians on whom councils often depend, and for its expanded discussion of the genuine marks of the church. Along the way, Luther touches on some of his most important and recurrent themes, and he often does so in very memorable language. First, for Luther, both church councils and church fathers are a mixed lot. They are unequal in quality, and they are also contradictory. Of the church fathers, Augustine is among the very best especially because he directs audiences to the Holy Scriptures and away from the fathers who set themselves, from bishops and from councils, and even away from himself. The source of all doctrine is the Holy Spirit communicating through the public word of God. I call your attention to the quote on, page, on your page 13, which in the interest of time I'll invite you to read on your own. The source of all doctrine is the spirit communicating through the public word of God. Because these inspired words of God can be falsified by heretics in the midst of controversy, Luther acknowledges that it is sometimes the case that fidelity to the teaching of scripture requires vocabulary that goes beyond the actual words of the Bible itself. In some Councils lack any power to establish new articles of faith, ceremonies that tyrannize consciences, or good works that exceed the commands of Scripture. Conversely, councils do have the responsibility to suppress and to condemn innovative new doctrines, ceremonies that contribute neither to conduct or discipline, and arbitrary works that oppose love. The best known passages of this treatise come near the end when Luther adumbrates his seven marks by which the Church of Jesus Christ may be recognized. These are an elaboration of and not a departure from the traditional Lutheran definition that distills the essence of the Notae Ecclesiae to gospel and sacraments. Luther begins here with the holy word of God, stressing its external character. He proceeds through baptism, the Lord's Supper, the public exercise of the office of the keys, and the office of ministers, whose task it is to give, administer, and use the word, the sacraments, and the keys. All of which is done on behalf of and in the name of the church. In addition, the people of God can be visibly discerned by the presence of prayer, public praise, and thanksgiving to God. Finally, Luther ventured what is probably the most famous sentence of this 170-page treatise, at least in the English edition. The holy Christian people are externally recognized by the possession of the sacred cross. For Luther, the scholar who inhabited the world of the Bible and who incurred the wrath of church and empire as a public confessor of the faith, suffering in the New Testament sense was axiomatic for Christians. The holy Christian people are externally recognized by the holy possession of the sacred cross. They must endure every misfortune and persecution all kinds of trials, and he uses the word anfektung there, and evil from the devil, the world, and the flesh, as the Lord's Prayer indicates, by inward sadness, timidity, fear, outward poverty, contempt, illness, and weakness, in order to become like their head, Christ. And the only reason they must suffer, 
is that they steadfastly adhere to Christ and God's word, enduring this for the sake of Christ. As Matthew 5 states, blessed are you when men persecute you on my account. These words would assume new urgency for Luther and especially for John Frederick in the years ahead. Luther's theology in the small called Articles of 1536 and his discussion of councils in 1539, as well as John Frederick's aversion to councils and colloquies, were tested by the Regensburg Colloquy of 1541, which neither Luther nor his prince actually attended. In what amounted to the last serious attempt to come to some compromise on the doctrine of justification, Melanchthon and his Roman counterpart, Gasparo Contarini, ventured what has for convenience been labeled by modern historians, double justification. Namely, only God's grace and the merits of Jesus Christ justifies sinners and saves them through faith, but this living faith has to demonstrate itself in works of love for one's neighbor. Advising his elector, Luther wanted no part of this compromise, for to him, in his context, it undercut the unconditional character of the gospel and implicitly encouraged sinners to trust their own good works rather than Jesus Christ alone for their sal salvation. In this context, the letter from Luther and John Bugenhagen to John Frederick is most instructive, especially in light of this essay's earlier theological and academic theses. The saying in Galatians 5, chapter 5, verse 6, concerning faith active through love, does not speak about justification, but about the life of the justified. There is much difference between being and acting. As the boys in school learn, the active and the passive verb. It is exact to speak of them differently. It is one thing to ask through what means one is justified before God. It is entirely another question to ask what the justified do or cause to happen. Becoming and doing are two different things. Becoming a tree and bearing fruit are two different things. But the papist trick is this, that one will be or is justified not only through faith, but also through works or through love and grace, what they call inherent, which is much the same thing. That is all false. And where they have that, they have it entirely and completely. And we have nothing of the sort. For nothing is worthy before God, but only and merely his dear Son, Jesus Christ, who is entirely pure and holy in himself, whom God sees and in whom he is well pleased. Now the Son is grasped and taken hold of in the heart, not through works, but only through faith without all works. Then God says, the heart is holy, and my Son will dwell therein through faith. When Luther was preparing the small called articles, when he was writing on the councils and the church, and when he was weighing in on controversies about justification, all the while he was teaching at the University of Wittenberg. From 1535 until 1545, he devoted his pedagogical attention to his lectures on Genesis, where all the major themes of the mature Luther are on display. I will call attention to three of them. First, one will not read far in these lectures without encountering Luther's intense polemic against monastic life, the institution that he believed had corrupted early Christianity and marked the end of the apostolic period. Monasticism burdened the consciences of the men and women who were unable to keep its vows, and just as bad or worse, it falsely offered a qualitatively superior avenue to pleasing God. 
While these aberrations were utterly intolerable for Luther, my larger point is that Luther's hostility to monasticism was also the occasion for an exposition and even celebration of authentic Christian vocation. What God seeks is not celibacy or monastic vows of supererogation, but instead the ordinary faith and trust that clings to God's promises brought to fulfillment in the death and resurrection of Jesus. This faith, which relies altogether on God's absolution and is itself the gift of the Holy Spirit, sanctifies even the most menial tasks of Elector John Frederick's most ordinary subjects. To those who seemingly contributed little and could claim even less, Luther's doctrine of vocation assured them of God's grace and favor, as well as the importance, indeed the holiness, of what they were doing in their home, their workplace, their community, and their congregation. These otherwise ordinary people were among the masks of God whose faith was active in love and service for the neighbors whom God had placed in their care. In the lectures on Genesis, this theology of vocation arises out of the Christocentric and promissory interpretation that God, that Luther gives, God too probably, but um, that Luther gives to the entire book. The key promises come in Genesis 3.15 and especially the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12.1-3. Without equivocation, Luther finds their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And then, following St. Paul in Galatians, he focuses on Genesis 15, verse 6. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. This trust, in the face of every adversity that would challenge the veracity of God's promises, is the essence of Christian existence. Abraham, of course, did not see the final fulfillment of these promises. Moreover, the intermediate installments of their fulfillment gave him little reason for optimism. But to Abraham, the patriarchs, the apostle Paul, and the Wittenberg reformers, including John Frederick, the gospel had nothing to do with optimism. Luther, the exegete, knew that optimism was not a biblical category. However, promise, hope, and fulfillment are biblical, and not just abstract biblical categories, but the real sum and substance of God's dealing with estranged human creatures and a broken creation. Luther read Genesis not in terms of their stories so much as of the triune God at work behind and in those stories. This personal God, whether in Genesis, Judea, or 16th century Germany, is immersed in the lives of the people created in his image. This is a personal God who makes and keeps promises, most decisively and characteristically in the death, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This fulfillment was more than the center of a theological system for Luther. It was the heart of his comfort, consolation, and eschatological hope. In a few short years, it would prove to be the same for his elector, too. Finally, John Frederick the Confessor after 1546. Luther concluded his lectures on Genesis in November 1545, saying, this is now the dear Genesis. God grant that after me others will do better. I can do no more. I am weak. <laughs>
Pray God for me that he may grant me a good and blessed last hour. His death three months later left John Frederick without his most important theological ally. But their partnership, precisely because it was grounded in a set of immovable theological convictions, did not end in February of 1546. One could argue that with respect to Elector John Frederick, Luther's theology bore its greatest fruit after his passing. To review briefly, the conspiracy of Emperor Charles V and erstwhile evangelical Duke Moritz led to the defeat of the Small Catholic League in spring 1547, to John Frederick's imprisonment, and to the loss of his position as Elector of Saxony. More important than the intrigue or the political machinations are the theological stakes involved. The faculty of the University of Wittenberg, the intellectual headquarters of the evangelical movement, scattered. Melanchthon and others debated how best to retain what they could of the Reformation's gains. Now that Luther himself had died, their prince was incarcerated, and the Council of Trent had begun. Whether their actions were noble and honorable, pragmatic compromise, or collaborationist to the point of betrayal continues to be debated. Would the condemnations of Worms from 1521 finally be realized? The adjective unprecedented is used too frequently, but it does accurately apply to the circumstances confronting princes, their subjects, and their theologians from 1547 to 1552. Yet the political confusion did not cloud John Frederick's theological judgment despite his grim situation. With no bargaining power, John Frederick's resolve was nonetheless firm and his course of conduct was consistent. In essence, he would do nothing that would entail an abandonment of Luther's theology or an abridgment of the scriptural gospel that Luther had taught him since his adolescence. John Frederick's acceptance of the Romanizing Augsburg Interim in 1548 would have meant his immediate release from prison. He unhesitatingly declined. Recall the first thesis from the beginning. Theology and not princes or politics drove the Reformation. And John Frederick was not about to let that change now. The Reformation may be in jeopardy, but theology in general and Luther's gospel in particular were still going to inform his conduct. The second thesis of this investigation pertained to the intellectual context that had helped give birth to and sustained Reformation theology. And this context had centered in the University of Wittenberg. John Frederick had done everything humanly possible to support this university and especially the theology that had come to define it. But even this university was a means to an end and not an end in itself. So it was that in connection with the so-called Wittenberg capitulation on May 19, 1547, John Frederick managed to convince the emperor that the university's library was in fact his own personal property. The library was packaged and transported to Weimar and then moved to Jena in 1549 where it became the nucleus of the library at the new university there upon its actual founding in 1558. The University of Jena, for which John Frederick had laid the plans before his death, became the home of Gnasio Lutheran resistance to the perceived compromises of the Leipzig Interim 
and the crypto-Calvinist aberrations concerning especially the Lord's Supper and the person of Christ. For John Frederick, and here's the, the point, for John Frederick, the academy was intended to serve Luther's doctrine of the gospel. If Wittenberg could no longer fill this role, Luther's theology would need to find a new institutional home. <clears throat> Near the end of his lectures on Genesis, Luther had stated, thanks to the kindness of God, we have a very good prince. When Luther died on February 18, 1546, about one year after making this comment, Justice Jonas conveyed the news to Elector John Frederick and to the Wittenberg theologians. John Frederick described his friend and father in the faith as such a dear man through whom God's word has again been brought to light. Martin Luther knew very well that his elector, while not without his shortcomings, had cultivated and supported a context within which this light of God's word could shine openly and warm the ground in which the seed of the gospel had been planted. In the providence of God, they needed each other, and they depended on each other. In other words, the gratitude was mutual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lum, for the fine paper. We now have some time for Q&A, questions and answers. Notice that there are mics available at each uh, corner here, so please address your, oh, sorry, so please address your questions from the mic, uh, like, <laughs> like I just didn't do, so, uh, excuse me, and uh, please state who you are and where you're from. Uh, first of all, I want to give both the other speakers an opportunity to ask questions. Notice that they will have a, a time this afternoon to respond uh, to each other in a, in a more uh, larger time frame. But first of all, if you want to ask a question, both you gentlemen are welcome to ask a question first. Since I uh, will have a chance to talk more about the essay this afternoon, I'll, I'll just ask an information question, Dr. Lum. Um, perhaps it would help us if you could unpack the significance of your characterization of Spalatin as a Renaissance humanist. He was, he was taught by the, um, uh, uh, he studied liberal arts, some theology and law um, at Erfurt and at Wittenberg, um, and in, um, uh, I have some notes here, so. Um, um, in 1503, he received his Master of Arts degree at the University of Wittenberg. So he, he um, uh, uh, had interaction with the key reformers. Um, that's about all I can do in terms of detail. We'll now open up uh, questions to the floor. Well, Herman, Herman Harsted from Mankato. I'm curious about uh, how long did the University of Jena live on? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know when it closed. It it opened as sort of a preparatory academy, somewhat analogous to a high school, and it it um, it became a full fledged university after John, shortly after John Frederick. Um, uh, Died. I, I, I don't know. I don't know its later history. May I just budge in here? Please. The University of Jena still exists. 
Yeah, it was it was the stronghold. You know, when you study the his, the historical background of the uh, controversies behind the formula of Concord, uh, it was the central place where um, uh, Genesio Lutherans were 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 clustered. If you've heard of Flatius, Flatius was there, I believe, until 1561 or something yeah. like that. But the big name Genesio is clustered around the University of Vienna. Okay, maybe just just to add a little more. Um, in, in addition, it's the Genesio Lutheran kind of had later on in the period of Lutheran Orthodoxy. This would be the center where Johann Gerhardt uh, would really center. Um, Johann Gerhardt's successor in Lutheran Orthodoxy takes in a generate in a direction that conflicts with Wittenberg uh, Orthodoxy. And later on, uh, you're going to get a time under the. Enlightenment, where it really becomes a major center of Enlightenment thinking in connection with uh, promoting Kantian uh, thought as well. So, there, There's a footnote in uh, one of the last pages of the paper. Uh, Wittenberg did not, did not um, and Electoral Saxony in general, did not become a central focus for what we might call Orthodox Lutheran theology until about um, the early 1570s when the, 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 the crypto-Calvinist movements and things like that had been exposed. And then under the leadership of Elector August of Saxony, Wittenberg again assumed a role of um, uh, centrality and import in that struggle that leads up to the Formula of Concord a few years later. Erling Teigen from here. Uh, in, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this really brings uh, uh, John Frederick to life, he being dead yet speaketh. Uh, uh, in your lecture this morning, you dis, uh, touched uh, quite a bit on the curriculum reform in the 1530s. Now, in the, and this reminded me of a hallway conversation that came up uh, yesterday. Uh, that is, uh, in the, Luther's uh, letter to the Christian nobility, in the last part, when he is describing the form of edu or the education that he wants to see, uh, Luther says that uh, he believes, or they are going to use uh, Aristotle's rhetoric, uh, philosophy, and logic. Now, that doesn't prove that they ever actually did. So the question is, uh, in your uh, studies, have uh, have you seen anything uh, directly, uh, uh, either in the 1520s or the 1530s, whether they were actually using Aristotle's rhetoric, politic, or rhetoric, uh, poetics, and logic? In terms of curricular or textbook lists, no. But but my my. Um and this depends on the work of people like. Uh, Brian Garish and others who've written on this. Uh, the issues with Aristotle were the metaphysical, the ethical, what amounted, what amounted to a new or kind of alternate worldview in the sense of, of non-biblical worldview. Um, and and I, I'm not aware of any I'm not aware of any critical statements about Aristotle's logic and, and, and rhetorical categories and things like that. And any, uh, probably the, my colleagues up here have done more work than I have on, on the rhetorical dimensions of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession and things like that, where those, where those, those rhetorical categories are on display. Uh, but I'm not aware of, of textbook enumerations or things like that. Um, the, the sort of worldview comment, that, that's, that goes back to disputation against scholastic theology and things, things like that. I had, uh, I had assumed that uh, 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 Schwiebert in his, uh, Luther in his times, uh, uh, has lots, of, I mean, he even digs into what the professors were paid and so on and so forth. Yeah. But so I thought that Schwiebert might possibly have because he does have some things on the curriculum, but I couldn't find anything last yeah. night. Schwie Schwiebert has um, the the more recent. The, it's, it's in the uh, the footnotes to the the paper. Um, the more recent 
two volume and one thing that Fortress published. I'm not sure the precise date on it. That is just a treasure trove of, of um, uh, information, not always, not always as, as um, presented in, in as exciting a way as one might like, but there's just, just mountains of facts in there about the university, the curriculum, the salaries, teaching loads of individual professors that, that many of us haven't heard of uh, for various semesters and things like that. Just a, but yeah, Schwebert is lots and lots of facts, and that's always a reliable place to go. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth Duff uh, from Martin Luther College in New Ulm. Uh, my question, just for a little bit more context, is uh, where was Martin Chemnitz educated, if you know that, and then by whom was he educated? Just, to, just for some more context with the continuity of the Reformation. Chemnitz, um, I didn't prepare anything on Chemnitz to the, to the best of my recollection. He was a, he was a Wittenberg student, um, knew, knew Melanchthon more than he did Luther. Um, uh, the sort of the sort of casual cliche, so take it for what it's worth, is that that Chemnitz reflects the style and method of Melanchthon and the substance of Luther, and that's that works for me. Um, but uh, that's in in rough terms. Chemnitz was a was a Wittenberg student. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Spouty from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. On page 11, you mentioned that in, this, in the restructuring of the University of Wittenberg, that Luther and Melanchthon were given some freedom in their duties. They were uh, the least specified of the, among the faculty. In what ways can you see that uh, that freedom that Melanchthon got later added to the fact that he was the leader of the Philippists there at, of the Wittenberg theologians in, like, in the Formula of Concord setting, the different controversies right. that they were guarding against? Yeah, I mean... Especially after Luther died, Melanchthon, Melanchthon was the, the one still standing. Melanchthon was the one who tried to, and this gets us into some pretty controversial territory, largely crafted the Leipzig interim to, to basically, there is that one line in the paper that, that, that whether he was pragmatic, collaborationist, or, or well, I forget how I put it in the first instance, um, <laughs> a betrayer. That, that was that was the third yeah. one. Yeah, um, I, I yeah I tried to put the nicest one first. Um, you know, Melanchthon was the one who was in the position to try to do those things, and just in the interest of full disclosure, you know, I'm sort of from the the Robert Cole school on this one. Um, and I, I tend, I, to be blunt about it, I pretty much put the best construction on what Melanchthon was trying to do. And, and the one, the one whether, and whether I'm right or wrong is, isn't really the point. Melanchthon, remember, died in 1560. So the most, the most serious, the most serious Philippist, crypto-Calvinist excesses and aberrations uh, come, I mean, the, the, mo the most crass ones, the one that, that, that exposed the crypto-Calvinist movement, uh, they take place after Melanchthon is gone. Um, again, that's, that's not to exonerate everything, everything Philip Melanchthon ever, ever said or did or attempted, but for, I give him the benefit of the doubt pretty much. <coughs> yeah, let's go with that. I hope that helped a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a, a quick follow-up. Then, uh, if you, if if Frederick had had given different a different parameters for Luther and Melanchthon's duties in the restructuring, uh, speculating here, but how would how would that have changed anything, if anything, of how uh, Melanchthon handled himself, kind of in the coming years? A, that's a hypothetical that I that I don't really think that that I have the, the data to address adequately, but B, there was, there was Luther and there was Melanchthon and 
pretty much nobody was, nobody, at least in, in my judgment, nobody else was at that level. I mean, when you get to Chemnitz and Andrea, they're, they're and, and Flatius, they're a next, they're in effect beginning their careers as these things were breaking. So um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that there was any, lo any other logical candidate to fill that role. Did he, did he have it in terms of personality and all the kinds of intangibles that go into those leadership equations? I'm not going to pass judgment on that. But you know, there, there is this one great Melanchthon quote, and it's a Melanchthon quote where he, in, bracketed from these controversies, where he talks about himself and his colleagues, four or five of them, and he says, so-and-so is this, so-and-so is that, so I'm this, and he mentions I think, one or two others, and then he says, but Luther is all of them. He, he, has, he has all of these gifts in ways, in ways that, that the rest of us can just do one of these things. So, so um, I don't know that there was any other logical person to, to fill that void. Thank you. President Molstead. Yeah, John Molstead here in Mankato. Uh, in the lecture, I know that you mentioned, uh, I think it's on page 13, that uh, Luther um, acknowledged the fact when he was talking about the councils and so on, acknowledged the fact that uh, sometimes for the case of fidelity to the scriptures, you have to go beyond and use some other words um, that go beyond the just the verba themselves of scripture. and. Uh, I, you know, he's often been criticized, obviously, for uh, in the Heilige Schrift, uh, you know, the align in Romans chapter three. Uh, would he have used this as? Um, I mean, is that how we justify, particularly the criticism, uh, his, his handling that criticism that came when he said that we uh, for, we maintain that a man is justified by faith alone, without yeah. the deeds of the law. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you know if if Luther had stated that in a do, in a doctrinal proposition, um, all of those who are allied with him would have said yea and amen. I think the rub comes when you insert the term in a translation of the biblical text, and that you know what I, what I was taking that statement in the um, on, on page thirteen is. Um, and in the context of that writing, one sometimes uses, the, and the history of the church is replete with using non-biblical vocabulary to sometimes do what, what, um, what was needed to be done. And the early and best councils, I think, reflect that. That's, that's about all I was doing with that. Dr. Courtright. Uh, just to this point, uh, Luther does respond to that in uh, his letter on translating and specifically takes up the issue of the insertion of a line and uh, calls the papists who are uh, criticizing him blockheads because they don't understand the need for the word in the German language to make the thought of Paul clear. So I, don't, I wouldn't see this as analogous to what's there. More to the point would be the... Uh, the, the kinds of, of extra biblical language, language that the Council of Nicaea and the Council of, of Constantinople had to add, or rather Chalcedon had to add to make clear the categories regarding Christ and his unique character. And Luther says, I, I don't like this terminology, but we need to use it because of, to maintain the, the tightrope that we're on here. Uh, but he wished we couldn't. Have, we didn't have to use it. Yeah, I mean the classic case yeah. of homoousius or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. I have a, I have a question, Dr. Lump. Um, I, I appreciate all the remarks you had about Renaissance humanism, how that was vitally important for Luther's development, and I got a soft spot for Kolb's understanding of uh, Melanchthon too. So I'm sympathetic there. I'm a little biased naturally, um, but. One of my uh, questions I have is you really kind of show how the two kinds of righteousness is kind of a fundamental hermeneutic dialectic 
to Luther's thinking. And you could come back and say, well, he's got like a sermon on two kinds of righteousness, three kinds of righteousness. Maybe you could miss it along the way. But it kind of undergirds the freedom of the Christian. It undergirds uh, the uh, two kingdoms and all of these things. You kind of see it per, per persuasive. I mean, it's, it's all throughout Luther's writings. It's, you know, and that doesn't mean to diminish law and gospel. And here's my real question. Why do you suppose that in the next generations, and even kind of it really kind of takes a while for us to really kind of maybe see that again in Luther? How come that emphasis that's kind of so fundamental for Luther, Luther's thinking doesn't always trickle down as clearly and doesn't seem to be used as thoroughly in the later generations, maybe even to the 19th, 20th century? If I understand the question correctly, two kinds of righteousness. Yeah, so I guess, like, wh why isn't that such a more fundamental hermeneutic in Lutheran theology afterwards? We're really kind of, in some ways, kind of rediscovering it in a sense, so that at least we're articulating it a little bit clearer. Okay. Why this, do you suppose that that is? This is, this is what I suppose it yeah, is. Yeah. And, and yeah. This, this is one where, where Robert Kolb and I, yeah. heaven forbid that I should ever... Um, but I will. He's not here and so forth. <laughs> he, he did, I should say, disclaimer, he did give me some bibliographic tips on this, on this John Frederick business, so I'm, I'm grateful to him for that. But, you know, the, the two kinds of righteousness, passive, God's gift in Christ, and now I'm pausing because that this the point of my answer, um, First of all, there's the, the, quant, the simple quantitative point. He talks about law gospel a whole lot more often than he talks about two kinds of righteousness. I mean, quant, it's overwhelming. And, you know, I, I went to the seminary at which Robert Kolb teaches, and I had him for class and, and all of that. And... Professor Kolb didn't start talking about this stuff until about 1990. Um, so, the, and that, again, there is the quantitative thing that just isn't nearly as much of it. My, my more substantive guess, two kinds of righteousness is a lot more challenging to, to define and state and make use of as soon as you start turning to active righteousness. Passive righteousness is, is easy to define. It's gospel. I'm the passive recipient of God's gifts in Christ. Active righteousness is not as easy to do an accurate thumbnail or a certain thumbnail description of. And if it causes that much... If it's if it's that if it's that difficult to work through, maybe you maybe people want to find a more straightforward conceptual tool to communicate, and law gospel is there. And two kinds of righteousness, I th I think, is more open to um, um, misunderstanding, ambiguity, what have you. That again, that is that is my supposition. President Molstad. Yeah, I'd like to ask another one with regards to, and by the way, I really appreciated the emphasis in here on um, how the L Luther's thought of the Haupt article uh, is so central, obviously, for, his, for all of his theology developed uh, because it's centered in the scriptures, and uh, how that drove things in the writing of the, of the small called articles. But on page 14, I wanted to just... Um, ask you to respond to something that, oh, it's a saying, you know, that many have used, and I'm curious whether you think it's a good saying to use or not, and I'm drawing attention to the major paragraph on that page, the full paragraph, where it would say there, on page 14, um, uh, it says that Melanchthon and his Roman counterpart, uh, Gasparo Cantarini, um, ventured what has for convenience been labeled double justification, namely only God's grace and the merits of Jesus Christ justifies sinners and saves them through faith. But this living faith has to demonstrate itself in works of love for one's neighbor, uh, 
neighbor, and then you say, of course, that Luther uh, was taking real exception to that. Um, I'd like to ask this, uh, wh how to respond to the saying that uh, people often use, uh, and that is that faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. Uh, do you think Luther, uh, how would Luther react to that and so on? I'm, I'm not aware of any specific response to that, that statement that, that we're justified by faith alone, but faith is never alone. Um, to the best of my knowledge, he, he would not, un, unless you're in some, you know, I, I think I threw the word context in here when I was doing the, the, the paper orally. Um, he was probably hypersensitive to these kinds of things. Uh, in the in in the context of 1541, I mean it's and this goes back to Lutherans from the very beginning are accused of being opposed to good works, and uh, uh, Luther, Melanchthon, all the rest consistently rejected that, and I do think it's interesting that that uh, the Augsburg Confession. Um, the first appearance of faith alone, to my knowledge, is in Article 6 on new obedience. So um, I, uh, I'm not aware of Luther ever commenting on the, the formulation that, 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 that you offered or that you uh, put out there. I've, I don't think it's problematic for him. Yeah. Just to follow up a little bit too, I'm assuming that when that phrase is used, faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone, and I know one of our prominent uh, theologians, uh, now a little bit incapacitated, has been one that uh, has used that quite often. And, uh, you know, of course, it's an interesting thing about the uh, nexus in Devalsus that way too, uh, that's important there about relationship between uh, what, what's pulling the cart here and so on. Of course, it's justification. Uh, but uh, I wonder, too, if some people have understood it to be that, well, faith alone, just, faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies never alone in the sense that all of our righteousnesses, if it was ever talked about in the area of justification, certainly are like filthy rags still. Uh, however, the righteousness of Christ, his act of obedience to his good works also are Counting for us that way as well. Yeah. Thank you. With that, we are at time, so we will recess uh, on, and we will resume again at two o'clock for a time of reaction and discussion that will be uh, moderated by Professor Erling Teigen. Enjoy your lunch.